Before I turn the floor over the, to our speaker, let me introduce him. So Andy Van Drum teaches linguistic and English as a second language at Cégep Limoy. After completing doctoral studies in linguistics, he is now working part-time on a master's degree in college pedagogy with Performa. Andy has also published a poor textbook with uh, Pearson RP and his great interest, interest in uh, technopedagogical tools and active learning has led him to work with Eductiv. His desire to innovate pedagogy in pedagogy has earned him an accuracy honorable mention and the EF Excellence Award in Language Teaching. Have a nice webinar, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, sure does put the pressure on. Um, I'm going to try and make things uh, maybe a little more uh, informal. Um, and first of all, um, I just want to contextualize uh, what I will be talking about today. So uh, my presentation is titled, Learning How to Learn Leads to the Belief One Can Learn. Metacognitive activities at the surface of mindset. Um, so, as Nicole said, um, I have been working part time for quite a few years now toward my master's degree in college pedagogy with Performa uh, at the Université de Sherbrooke. And I've been uh, completing my research project over the past two years. Today is actually the very first time I get to present the project, the outcomes uh, verbally. So I'm very excited about that. Um, and I'm also super excited because this morning I found out that my college is offering me release time to continue this study and extend its scope uh, to a wider uh, audience. So with more participants over the next school year, um, so there's lots of things coming up, and uh, I'm very happy that this is not the end uh, of this research topic. So um, today, I would uh, like to start by explaining the context uh, and the problem situation. So what were my observations that led me to want to investigate um, the issue of metacognitive activities and how they could uh, potentially influence the mindset of our students. Then I will get into the hands-on activities that I uh, developed, uh, which are called metacognitive wrappers. And um, just so you don't have to take my word for it, I will end by presenting some of the results of the studies that I conducted. So all throughout, if you have any questions, uh, please don't hold back. You can use the Q&A module. Uh, I will try and keep an eye on that and uh, as well as my PowerPoint, and I'll try also my very best not to get sidetracked. Um, if the question uh, relates directly to something I'm presenting, I will uh, be very happy to address it right away. Or if not, uh, there will be a question and exchange period at the very end of the webinar. Um, so there will be uh, plenty of opportunities to make sure that all of your questions get answered. Um, so first of all, I also want to say thank you for uh, taking the time to attend. And I'm very happy to see some familiar names uh, popping up in the chat. It's always uh, a pleasure to know that, that our colleagues uh, are interested in, in what we are doing. So without any further ado, um, so I'm an ESL teacher English as a second language teacher. Uh, in Quebec City at Cégep Limoilou. Uh, it's a college of about four and a half thousand students. And I also teach in the uh, language program, but the studies that I conducted and so the activities are, that I designed are aimed at general education ESL classes. I conducted my study at the highest level, English 103. But the idea, as I said earlier, is to extend the scope and to demonstrate that um, 
this pedagogical practice can indeed be beneficial to students of all levels. So all of that to say that I will be mostly talking about my own experience in English as a second language, but the whole idea is that the activities that I've designed can be transferred to virtually any discipline. Uh, so they are not tied in uh, specifically to English as a second language. So what sparked my interest in mindset and in metacognitive activities? Well, over the past 12 years uh, in my teaching practice at the college level, I've observed many a time that week one, before we even start the course, students come and talk to me and they say, well, I'm not sure I'm at the right level. Or they come and tell me, I don't expect to do well. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not good in English or English is not my cup of tea. Or on the other hand, especially in the higher levels, I get students saying me, I'm, I'm not really sure why we still have mandatory English courses. I'm not sure what I'm doing here. I've always had a uh, hundred percent or close to a hundred percent in high school. I'm fully bilingual. I have nothing left to learn, right? So all of that can be summarized by a perceived impossibility of improvement. Either the student feels that they're not good in English and they cannot improve, or they consider they're already perfect and therefore they have nothing left to learn. Um, and this obviously relates to a discrepancy between their actual competence and their perceived competence. But what all of these students have in common is that they come to talk to me because they, um, they have a lack of motivation. They come and share that information because they question uh, the pertinence of that course in their curriculum. So right from the start, um, they, they are not motivated to learn. So not only um, did I observe this phenomenon uh, as it was reported to me by students over the years, but it is also something that's been acknowledged and confirmed in the literature with regard to language learning, so ESL, but also FSL, French as a second language, or in French first language courses. So I've, um, you will notice that on the slides, I've uh, included some references, um, the most important ones, and you will find the complete references uh, on the last few slides uh, that will be shared with you as well. Um, but as, as I hinted at earlier, this phenomenon is not exclusive to language uh, classes. It's also observed in general education. Um, so physical education, philosophy, uh, et cetera. Um, that uh, lack of motivation that students bring right from the beginning of the session. So that is the problem uh, that sparked my interest in um, metacognition and mindset. So um, my research framework basically contains four distinct concepts. The, the central one, so to speak, is mindset. And I will expand on that a, a little later. Uh, but basically mindset relates to the belief whether or not somebody can improve their competency. Um, so it truly is a belief. It doesn't necessarily need to correlate with uh, the student's uh, perceived skills. Okay, so it's not the exact same thing as self-efficacy, for example. My uh, idea or uh, my hypothesis, if you like, 
was to try and uh, improve uh, students' growth mindset. So to get students to believe that they can learn regardless of their current skill level. Um, and to do that by offering metacognitive activities. So by showing them how to learn, getting them to believe that and understand that they can learn. And then ultimately, I also wanted to see whether that would have uh, any sort of impact and hopefully, obviously, a positive impact on the student's motivation. Because remember, that was the initial problem, the student's lack of motivation. So if by offering metacognitive activities, I were to um, spark a growth mindset, would that have a positive influence on the motivation of the students? And would that uh, make them more uh, engaged, especially more cognitively engaged in their classes? So before I get to um, the hands-on activities, I would like to present uh, these concepts in a little more detail. I don't want to bore or burden you with all of the theories behind these concepts, but I think it is important to set the table so we all share that common understanding as to um, where uh, all of this um, falls into place, so to speak. So metacognition is typically uh, divided into three aspects. Um, metacognition, or thinking about thinking, thinking about learning, uh, awareness of cognition, or whatever you want to call it, um, is rooted in metacognitive knowledge. So knowing about the strategies uh, knowing what the best ways are to learn, which can be taught explicitly. There is regulation of cognition, uh, which relates to students' capacity to harness the appropriate strategies at the right time, so they know what to do uh, to become more effective learners. But all of that meets in uh, or through metacognitive experiences. And that is the aspect of metacognition I decided to focus on because I wanted this pedagogical practice to be uh, accessible and beneficial to everybody in my class groups. So I didn't necessarily want to teach metacognitive um, theories or strategies explicitly. Uh, rather, I wanted students to um, experience different metacognitive strategies so they could uh, more intuitively and more informally figure out for themselves what worked, uh, what didn't work, and uh, help them understand that they could learn if they um, if they apply those metacognitive strategies. So in my course, I uh, implemented what are called metacognitive wrappers, which is one type of metacognitive experience. Um, and of course, uh, there are plenty others. Uh, maybe we'll have the opportunity to exchange on um, similar activities you put into place in your own courses, but I will explain um, in just a few moments what exactly I did, so what these metacognitive wrappers consist of. So I brought up the concept of mindsets. Mindset theory um, is rooted in Carol Dweck's uh, work. Um, so in uh, psychology, she is the, the researcher who mostly worked on the concept of mindset. And she distinguishes between fixed and growth mindset, which are basically two extremes on one continuum. 
uh, what is important to realize is that all individuals um, are situated in different places on that continuum. So we cannot affirm, okay, one person has a growth mindset and somebody else has a fixed mindset. So we're, everybody is situated somewhere along that continuum and can be situated in different places depending on the competency or task um, that we're talking about. So for example, um, I could firmly believe that I can uh, continue learning languages if I put in the effort. So that would be a growth mindset. But at the same time, I could uh, foster the belief that I'm really not good at mathematics and that regardless of any work I put in, it's just not my strength and there's no way I can wrap my uh, head around that. And so I would have more of a fixed mindset with regard to mathematics. The good news though, is that studies have demonstrated that we can um, influence people's mindsets. Um, this has been demonstrated with so-called mindset interventions, which is not something I uh, worked on. Um, but so there are studies that exposed students more explicitly to mindset theory and observed um, improvements uh, in growth mindset following that intervention. I wanted to achieve uh, a similar outcome, but by using metacognitive strategies not as part of one single intervention, but as part of a weekly um, metacognitive program. So in a nutshell, um, people who have more of a growth mindset are going to attribute their failures to effort. So if they don't do so well on a task, they might ask themselves what they can do more or differently to um, to do better next time. So because they believe that putting in an effort leads to improvement, they will just work harder. They won't necessarily get discouraged in the face of failure. That's because they tend to see challenges, difficulties as learning opportunities, not as obstacles. And that leads them to be more optimistic and more persevering, uh, especially in a course where there are several uh, evaluations. So if they don't do so well on one, they will continue uh, investing themselves um, in hopes of improving. Somebody who has more of a fixed mindset tends to, as I explained with my um, example of uh, mathematics, tends to think of their skills as related to intelligence or talent. In other words, things that they have less control over and that they uh, don't consider they can improve, right? So they doubt their ability to improve. Because of that, um, they tend to avoid uh, threatening situations. And by that, I mean situations that, um, that pose a challenge. Um, and they do so to protect their self-esteem because if they engage with a challenging activity and they don't do so well, they're going to link that to a lack of intelligence or a lack of talent. So they tend to avoid those situations. And that's obviously not a good thing when we're talking about learning, right? So these students tend to feel more helpless, more anxious, um, and again, that is not uh, uh, an appropriate mindset for learning. So just um, to visualize things a little differently, if we think about mindsets in general, or in my case, language mindsets, on uh, the left-hand side, students who have a growth mindset will tend to set learning goals for themselves. They uh, seek out those challenges because they believe that those challenges are what allow them to learn. Um, and on the other hand of the continuum, on the other 
end of the continuum, sorry, um, students with more of a fixed mindset um, might avoid um, challenging situations if they perceive their competence as being low. So we typically see that in um, 100, 101 level groups where students avoid engaging in discussions, for example, simply because of the high level of anxiety it generates, because they feel like they're not good at that and they don't want um, people to, to believe or see that um, what, what they uh, perceive to be a, a lack of talent. Or on the other hand, students, uh, especially those in their higher levels, so who perceive their um, L2 competence as being high, they will set performance goals for themselves. So they're going to study just for the grade. They're not necessarily uh, looking to improve. They just want to do what is uh, expected to get a good grade. Last slide um, that focuses more on the theoretical aspects, I promise, and the integrated conceptual framework I came up with as part of my research. Um, so this is adapted from Roland Viau's model of uh, motivational dynamics. Um, and what you see in the dotted lines, so metacognitive activation, and language mindset are basically the, the uh, concepts that I sought to integrate into the existing framework. So um, in Vio's uh, model of motivational dynamics, it's the pedagogical activity that um, is going to influence the student's perceptions of their competency, of the task value, and of the control they have over that task, which then in turn is going to have an impact on the student's cognitive engagement and their perseverance, which ultimately leads to learning. So what I wanted to investigate and hopefully prove was that by uh, including a metacognitive activation um, before the pedagogical activity, I would be able to induce a growth mindset. So uh, a belief that would positively influence the student's perceptions of competency, task value, and controllability. So um, my hypothesis is that before those determining factors that we, we can observe, there are actually the beliefs, the preconceived ideas that live in students' minds, but that as teachers, we also do have some control over. Right, so all of that um, to contextualize the practice that I put into place, um, that of metacognitive wrappers. So metacognitive wrappers are activities. They tend to be in the form of a questionnaire. Um, and in my case, I implemented them as part of um, my electronic course notes that I distribute through OneNote. But you could uh, offer them to students as uh, a little interactive quiz. So using Kahoot or WooClap or another platform, they could be offered simply verbally um, in class, or they could be printed on course notes or even on evaluations. But the principle is always the same. There um, are a couple of questions that surround the pedagogical task, so the learning task as such, hence the name wrapper. It truly wraps around the activity. And um, the activities seek to question uh, the students on their study and work habits before the task so that they can keep uh, reflecting on this during the task. And then afterwards, invite students to analyze the process they've gone through and the results of the task after they completed it so they can hopefully make adjustments toward the future. 
I'll give you a couple of examples of the metacognitive wrappers that I designed for my course. At the end of the presentation, I have also included a link uh, to an article I recently published on Eductive and uh, in which uh, you find embedded PDF documents with all of the metacognitive wrappers that I designed. Um, so obviously I cannot present all of them um, and I, I'd like to focus on a couple of questions so it's more um, ergonomical on the slides as well, but you will have access to uh, all of the activities. So uh, these wrappers concern three elements of learning. So there is the preparation for the task. Um, so you will see uh, in these examples, which relates to um, the formulation of a thesis statement, which is an essential element in essay writing in ESL classes. The first question focuses on declarative knowledge, right? What are the components of a strong thesis statement as you have understood them? So what is highlighted in green is the question asked and underneath you find um, an example answer of one student. So this is an authentic example. I didn't uh, tweak it. Uh, these are the answers given by one of the students uh, in one of my groups. Um, so here, obviously, uh, we're inciting the students to reflect on, okay, what, what am I asked to do? Do I have the, all of the necessary knowledge um, to be able to successfully complete that task? So maybe this is where they already realize, hmm, not quite sure what the components of a strong thesis statement are, and uh, I will need to look them up first. The second question uh, relates to the use of strategy. So explain how you plan to make sure uh, that you uh, implement a thesis statement with these principles. So um, we're, we're encouraging the student to reflect on how to then put that declarative knowledge into practice. And of course, uh, these are essential tools for the students to fully understand what is expected and how uh, to bring that to fruition. After the activity, um, we can encourage students to reflect on the challenges they've encountered. And if you give feedback or it's part of an evaluation, maybe even reflect on uh, types of mistakes that they might have made. So after the task, right away before handing it in, um, you could um, ask the students, well, what did you do to apply these principles to your best extent and what challenges did you encounter? A follow-up question that I always ask is, well, what do you think you need to be able to, in this case, write a successful thesis statement. So in light of the challenges encountered, do I need further explanations? So that's where uh, we as teachers uh, come in. Would I like to have some more examples? Do I require further practice or something else? Right, so um, in, instead of um, leading the student to believe, oh, I did well, or um, it, it was a complete disaster, but I don't know what to do. Well, we encourage them to reflect on the tools and strategies they can put into place to understand why they did well or why they didn't do so well, um, so that they also see that it's, it's not the end of the world. Learning is possible even when there are certain setbacks. So that's where the last part comes in, potential adjustments. Again, getting the student to reflect on what exactly they did and um, getting them then to reflect on, based on the feedback they received, what do you intend to do differently next time you are asked to uh, complete a similar task? And the whole idea 
of these metacognitive wrappers is to increase students' awareness of uh, their learning, how they learn, so that they understand they can learn, and to also um, get them to become more autonomous in that process. So throughout my course, I offer these questions, I offer checklists um, to help them um, work on their metacognitive aptitudes. But at the very end of the session, before the final exam, I designed a more um, general or bro uh, broader scoped metacognitive wrapper, uh, so with uh, more general questions. How much time do you estimate you will need, again, based on prior experience? At this point, are you missing any information or strategies to achieve your objective? Again, encouraging the student to reflect on all of the strategies that were covered and then uh, getting them to select the ones that are relevant to them. And also uh, drawing attention to the descriptive evaluation grid and um, getting students to set a goal, a learning goal for themselves. And uh, I know I, I've been repeating this a couple of times, but the purpose here is always to get the students to realize that they can learn, and they can improve. As I said, I'm not expecting you to take my word uh, for the fact that um, these activities are indeed useful. Um, so very briefly, I, I do want to uh, talk to you about the study I set up. Um, so I um, offered these metacognitive wrappers on a weekly basis, as I said. I tied them in to as many activities uh, as I could. And then I designed um, questionnaires um, to gain feedback from students. So I administered a questionnaire throughout the session, and I conducted semi-structured interviews at the end of the session. And I gathered qualitative and quantitative data. So it was a mixed method study. So what I did was I administered a survey, a questionnaire um, containing questions of um, questionnaires that had been tested before and that dealt with language mindset, with metacognitive aptitude, and with motivation. So I distributed this questionnaire at the very beginning of the session before we started the learning sequence in week one, I administered a shorter version focusing only on the mindset component in week six and 10. And then uh, the same questionnaire that I um, gave in week one, I gave it again in week 15. So at the end of the learning sequence. And then the semi-structured interviews followed afterwards after the final grades had been uh, given back. So here is just a quick example of what uh, these questionnaires uh, looked like. So um, students were invited on a Likert scale to indicate their, um, their degree um, or whether they agreed or disagreed uh, to a certain uh, degree with these statements that were given. And based on those statements, I was then able to establish um, their metacognitive aptitude, their level of motivation, and their mindset. So, uh, you, yes? Uh, there are five minutes left in your presentation. Okay. Perfect. And I have one question from uh, Hélène Surbat. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so I only have a couple of minutes left, um, and I'm also very happy to stick around um, to answer your questions uh, if, if ever we, we don't have enough time. So uh, what I observed was that there was a statistically significant improvement in uh, the score on metacognition between weeks one and 15. 
Um, so you can see that on a scale of uh, zero to six, so the Likert scale, uh, there was a, a full point increase in metacognitive aptitude over uh, the course of the 15 weeks. Mindset, so growth mindset, which you see um, top left in blue went up also by about uh, one point or uh, just under a point and growth, uh, sorry, fixed mindset characteristics went down. And almost parallel with the increase in metacognition, the um, intensity of the motivation of the students went up. So that is what the data, um, quantitative data showed. Of course, um, quantitative data doesn't give us all of the detail, um, but in the semi-structured interviews, I was able to confirm that pattern. So um, I'm giving you the example of uh, Anne, um, which is a, a pseudonym, of course. So at the beginning of the course, Anne was questioning herself, what was she doing in English 103? Uh, she was finding it very difficult, whereas in high school, it was uh, always super easy for her. Um, then she says that throughout the, the session, the metacognitive wrappers were really useful because um, they allowed her to classify the information, put all of the elements together, and then she says it worked. Um, she also thought it was interesting because they helped her perceive herself and her efforts. Um, so at the end of the session, through these metacognitive wrappers, she understood what she needed to do, and that's what really motivated her. So we see uh, how all of these concepts seem to intersect. Um, and of course, a larger scale study would be needed to, um, to find out exactly how they all connect. But we can uh, observe that there is an increase in metacognitive attitude in uh, growth mind in motivation. So to end, I also want to point out uh, a quote that stood out to me in uh, Carol Dweck's book on mindset. The prospect of student success is centered around a teacher revealing a personal growth mindset. Conversely, teachers with a fixed mindset create an atmosphere of judging, but that the belief that all students can progress, teachers will not experience growth in their students. So all of this to say that, sure, putting into place these activities uh, does seem to have a positive influence, but we mustn't forget that uh, for this to be effective as teachers, first and foremost, we need to believe in it. And that goes through uh, other aspects of the teaching experience as well. So, of course, if um, in feedback we focus on, well, this doesn't seem to be your strength, Jake, then we're basically instilling a fixed mindset. Whereas if we're questioning the student, well, what did you do here? And what could you do differently to obtain this result? Well, we're encouraging the student to think about their learning and to, to change their strategies. So as teachers, if we implement this kind of pedagogical practice, we mustn't forget that it, it is but one piece of the puzzle and that there are lots of other components uh, that come into play when we talk about motivation and mindset. Um, so obviously um, this is but a, a very brief summary of what I did in my course as part of this study and what came out of it. Um, but um, my master's dissertation will be available as of the fall. Um, there's already, as I said, an article on eductive that's available. You can scan the QR code or when you receive the PowerPoint, simply click on the link. And I'm always very happy to uh, exchange on this uh, topic by email. Uh, do feel free to reach out to me. Um, so that's it for me. Um, so I'm, 
I'm going to have a look at the yeah. Q&A or yeah. Nicole can... Uh, can yeah, oh, I, 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 I would like to say before that your presentation was uh, informative, it was original, okay, and uh, very ins inspiring. Thank you, uh, Andy. And yes, the two questions question we have, I'm sure that all people would like to uh, hear your answers. The first one from uh, Hélène Surbass, she said fascinating. Did the students complete the wrappers in class or at home outside of the class time? Did you collect all of them? Did you comment on them, return them to the students? That's an excellent question. So in uh, my case, because I use OneNote, um, it, it's like an ongoing conversation. So for most of the learning activities, because we completed them in class, the students completed the metacognitive wrappers in class. However, there were certain uh, instances, for example, when they received their annotated copy of the midterm essay, and then I asked them to complete uh, the metacognitive wrapper related to that, uh, at home, but they had time for it. So it was uh, part of their, their homework. Um, but of course, um, it, it isn't uh, a magic formula. And I, I have to admit that there, there weren't any points on it. So some students uh, didn't complete all of the metacognitive wrappers, um, but I did encourage them obviously to, to do so. And I always commented on them um, so they they could um, easily see um, the the importance and the benefits to them. Thank you, uh, Andy. The other question from uh, Simon Côté Mascotte: Have you tried this strategy at lower levels, for example, uh, 100 or 101? For example, I feel like uh, 103 students are more motivated than them on average, and I wonder if uh, motivating the 100 or 101 students to actually complete the wrappers might become an issue in itself. Mm -hmm. um, so unfortunately, I haven't had the opportunity to uh, try the strategy at lower levels yet. I will uh, be able to do so in the fall. Um, and I agree that uh, it motivation here to to actually complete the metacognitive wrappers is an important uh, aspect of uh, the practice. So it, it might be necessary uh, to to find ways to encourage students to to complete them, uh, for example, by um, by requiring them to complete that self reflection uh, for them to receive feedback on the task itself. Um, or, or there might be other strategies that can be put into place um, to, to get students to, to see how this is beneficial to them. Thank you, Andy. It was very interesting. And thank you to all the participants. And I hope we'll have uh, the opportunity to meet you again, uh, maybe at uh, AQPC Colloc. Will you be there? Uh, no, you will uh, in uh, Maroc during the AQPC. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, I won't be there. So that's why okay. I was excited to be able to present today, but I'll be accompanying a group of students. Exactly. Okay. Thank you very much, Andy, and uh, see you soon. Thank you very much.